I am, I remain astonished. An article came out on Bart Ehrman's blog, uh, what, three days ago? Three days ago. Nope, Jesus is not Yahweh, the Bart Ehrman blog. Now, ever since Bart Ehrman debated that fellow from Dallas Seminary, who brought this up and said, well, wait, what about Paul in Philippians 2? He quotes passage about Yahweh, applies it to Jesus. Every knee bow, every tongue confess. You know, will not give his glory to another. This is about Yahweh. And, and Bart just looked like a deer in a headlight. What, that, that's, that's Sibelianism. No, no, that's not Sibelianism. What, what are you talking about? It really seems like Bart Ehrman slept through systematic theology class at Moody. I mean, and he, and evidently will not be corrected. I, it does not surprise me that a Princeton seminary grad from his days would have never read Warfield. But I'd invite him to try it for a second to find out that the seminary he graduated from, that one of its greatest professors of all time would set him straight on this, have an idea of, of what this is all about. But he doesn't get it. After, after all these years, after how many people have pointed out, he just, when it comes to theology, Bart Ehrman is not a reliable source at all, at all. All. He does not understand Christian theology very well at all, and he's not willing to learn. Um, but here's what he says. He says, in my last post, I pointed out that some conservative evangelical Christians, maybe others, these are the ones I know about, claim that Jesus in the Bible is actually to be understood as Yahweh. I think that's completely wrong, and in this post, I want to explain why. Okay. Again, if someone knows better than I do, let me know. Well, uh, how, how about B.B. Warfield? Could we... You're a Princeton grad. It's where your PhD is from. All right? Go to B.B. Warfield. Simple enough. There are many others. Um, but I've never even heard the claim, let alone discussion of it, until very recently. Really? I wonder if there are any early Christian theologians who have this view. Really? <clears throat> or even later ones prior to recent times. Oh, well, there was those strange things that Justin Martyr said to Trifo the Jew that identified Jesus as Yahweh. That was the middle of the second century. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he's, he's a historian, but it, it, it doesn't look like he's good with the theology of, of the thing. Uh, it is not the view of traditional Christian theology, at least as I learned it once upon a time. Do you hear these weasel words? You mean as you didn't learn it once upon a time. It was certainly not the view of the earliest Christians. It is not a view set forth in the Bible. The Bible, of course, does not have the Trinity. But when Christianity formally had the doctrine of the Trinity, the Father was Yahweh and Christ was his Son. At least that's what Christians who read their Old Testament said. Now, I, I told everybody, hey, save this. Save this article. Lest it disappear into the mists of time. Because, wow. Here is Bart Ehrman assuming Unitarianism and hence ignoring Passage after passage after passage where the New Testament writers identify the Son as Yahweh. They identify the Father as Yahweh as well. And there's the problem. He was never a Trinitarian because he was never actually a Christian. He never understood it. And now he's tilting at windmills. Want some examples? I didn't think you would ever ask. More than happy to provide a few. You probably, people who listen to this program, you should, off the top of your head, be able to give numerous examples where Jesus is identified as Yahweh in the New Testament. You should be able to give examples where the Father is identified as Yahweh uh, as well, because they both are. And that's the point. The same New Testament. See, and this is why Bart can't do systematic theology, is he does, does not believe that you can do systematic theology. He says, eh, the Bible doesn't know anything about the Trinity. You can't understand the New Testament without understanding the Trinity. The writers 
absolutely would be babbling incoherently, which is basically what he thinks they're doing, if you don't have the doctrine of the Trinity, if you don't recognize that Peter was an experiential Trinitarian. He heard the Father speak from heaven. He walked with the Son. He's now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But they, that requires you believing that the Bible is a consistent whole, which is the fundamental thing that Bart Ehrman does not want you to believe. And he doesn't, so therefore he can't even begin to meaningfully comment on what the New Testament teaches. Because from his perspective, the New Testament teaches nothing. New Testament does not teach anything. The New Testament teaches differing and contradictory views, depending on which book of the Bible you're reading. All right? So, where would you go? Well, there are so many. It's so cold. I love it. <laughs> See, you got to, before you go to the text, you got to remember, I'm so old. Rich, Rich would just, you know, we need, we need to possibly get some rocking chairs so that you and I can just, well, we can rock in these, I suppose. So then you and I can start. Yeah, I got a rocking chair. You're, but did you ever have a lunchbox that you took to, to, to school? Did it have like uh, Scooby-Doo or, or Superman or anything like that? Hot Wheels, Hot Wheels, you bet. That was good. That was good. Yeah. Yep. And it was, they were embossed and had the you know, really colorful and stuff. And inside, what would you have? Aside from whatever your mom, whatever sandwich your mom made you that morning, and maybe some some Cheetos or, or uh, Frito, Frito. What's the Frito-Lay things you like? The Oh, just Fritos. That's right, Fritos. Um, but you also had a thermos bottle. Now, they were way too breakable, weren't they? Because it was glass inside. But they were thermos bottles. But to keep it cold, even to lunch, they had to be so thick that there wasn't much in there. I mean, these things would have been awesome <laughs> back then. So you see, I'm fascinated by this because here is technology, man. I'm still thinking about my plastic and glass uh, Superman, Spider-Man, whatever it was, thermos in my, in my, yeah. I'm wondering if my grandkids are going, I'd like to have one of those. <laughs> now, I bet you they've got them on eBay someplace. There's a, there's probably a few that haven't broken over the years that uh, we could, uh, we could track down. But uh, anyway, uh, how did I get on that? Oh yes, before we get to the text, there we go. Where do you go? Well, there are so many. I'm just going to cover two real quick. You already are familiar with these, and especially if you listen to the sermon that I did at G3 last year and then repeated it to uh, Apologia, this is one that you know. And this is just the place that I would just immediately go, especially with someone like Bart Ehrman. We, now, by the way, we challenged Bart Ehrman to debate this subject, and um, but we didn't have $25,000 uh, to pay. Plus what? Oh yeah, and he re he retains all media rights. So if he didn't like how it went, then it, then no one would ever see it. So yeah, we said no, I don't think so. But be had we would be happy to debate Bart Ehrman on this because there's no way he can win. Um, he's wrong, demonstrably wrong. And here's an example of it. So in John chapter 12, at the end of Jesus's public ministry, um, yeah, I guess I can go ahead and do do do. Do, do, do. End of Jesus' public ministry. Uh, for this reason, verse 39, they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, quoting from the Greek subject, he has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their hearts, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6. I see that right over there, if you want to, to verify that. This is from Isaiah's great temple vision where I saw the Lord. Now, the first statement is saw Adonai, um, but then it's Yahweh speaking all the way through Isaiah chapter 6, sends Isaiah on and makes him his prophet and sends him on his mission, so on and so forth. And of course, he's the one who is surrounded by the, the cherubim. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. And this is the vision that we have 
in Isaiah chapter 6. Then notice what John 12, 41 says. These things, tau to ipen Isaiah, Isaiah, notice he's quoting from the Greek Septuagint, hati aiden tain doxon autu, kai elalesen peri autu. So Isaiah said these things. Now, what does he just quote from Isaiah 6? Temple vision. Because he saw his glory and he spoke about him. Now, if you think that somehow the subject has changed, the verse, next verse says, Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, ice out on, believed in him, but because the Pharisees, they were not confessing him publicly, they be put out of the synagogue. Who is the him? Jesus. Jesus. So these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke about him. So Isaiah, whose glory did you see? I saw Yahweh's glory. John, whose glory did you see? Did Isaiah see? He saw Jesus' glory. Now, it's even stronger than that, as we've pointed out, because there is a fascinating textual variant in the Greek Septuagint in comparison to the Hebrew Masoretic text. And again, if you want a further discussion of this, like I said, the G3 sermon I did last year, and I had a little bit more time to develop it, Apologia Church, so that would have been well, February, March, somewhere. It was right after we got back. You can look it up, Apologia Studios, on YouTube. But there is a textual variant here. And in Isaiah 6.1, in the Septuagint, instead of it saying what the Hebrew says, the train of his robe was filling the temple, it says his glory filled the house. And so the one place... Because some people tried to get around this. They would say, well, he also quoted from Isaiah 53 up above. And so maybe that was, no. The one place where glory is seen is in Isaiah 6 in the Greek Septuagint, which would be the translation of the scriptures that the people John's writing to would have in their own possession. So when he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, there's no question of what he's citing from. It's Isaiah's temple vision. It's where Isaiah saw Yahweh. And it's about Jesus. He saw him and spoke concerning him. Fits perfectly with John 1, 1 through 18. Who is the monogamous theos, the unique God that exegetes the Father? Jesus. Now, again, Ehrman assumes Unitarianism. Has to. He, he doesn't have any divine revelation. So he has to assume Unitarianism. But then... All you then can say is, well, okay, the New Testament writers contradicted themselves. No, they didn't. There is something greater, which is why you're an apostate and don't believe and didn't understand and misrepresent even now. John 12. So, anybody else do that? Well, we know others did that. We know that Paul does it a number of times. But I think it's fascinating to just remind us of because it lets us go back to the Greek Septuagint again. First uh, Peter chapter three, verse fourteen. But even if you should suffer the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now notice that in the New American Standard, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, is in all caps. And that is because that is a citation from, you'll see it right over here, Isaiah 8, 12. The problem is, if they were consistent, and notice over here in the Greek, you'll notice the italics, the Nessalon 28, tam de faban auton me fabethete, fabethete, meda tarakthete, and then look at this. Kurion is still in italics. Hagiasata is still in italics. So why didn't these two over here end up in italics? I wish they had. If, if there was going to be consistency, the New American Standard should have put sanctify, which is 
which is Hagiazo, and Kurian, Lord, in italics as well, because it's continuation of the same quotation from Isaiah 8. Now, there is a variant here. The Textus Receptus has a different reading uh, than the Nestellan uh, text does at this point. Uh, you'll notice right here, uh, the Textus Receptus has Theon. And that's the Byzantine reading over against P72, Sinaiticus, Alexandrus, Vaticanus, etc., etc. It's basically the earliest text versus the later text is the... Um, well, sorry. There, now it's now it's now it's visible. Um but so first Peter 315 isn't uh accessible to TR only folks and King James only as as far as that goes. But here you you literally have but treat as holy the Messiah as kurios, and that kurios is the Greek Septuagint's rendering of the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. But treat as holy Christ as Yahweh in your hearts. Always ready to give, to make a defense, everyone asks you a reason. That's, uh, if you've heard me speak on 1 Peter 3, I've confessed for a decade now that I had spoken on that text over and over and over again as an apologist, because it's the key apologetics text. And had never seen what the background was. And it is recognizing who Christ is, that he is God in human flesh. That prioritizes everything else so that you will respond to all the difficulties and challenges of life differently. And that's what will cause people to ask you a reason for the hope that's within you. They will see the hope that's within you because you prioritize in light of Jesus being who this text says he is. Just one of many, just one of many that demonstrate that Paul, Peter, John, they all do the same thing. Bart Ehrman's wrong. I don't know why. I don't know how this huge hole in his history and training and theology is to be explained, but there it is. It was exposed at that debate. Um, and... He continues to uh, to do that as well. 